irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Peace Fund Radio with Ethan Denmeyer and Adrian Paul, right here on LA Talk Radio. Good morning. I would like to sing this morning. What are you shaking your head about? I didn't shake what, my what head, are you head at all. You I'm were smiling. Laughing. You I'm were smiling. smiling. This is not... good. We like it when you when you're smiling I, first thing in the morning. I, I smile. A, I, I smile a lot. I don't know if you guys know. <laughs> are that. you smiling inside? Ethan? I'm always That's... smiling inside. Even, <laughs> when, even when I'm frowning at you, I'm smiling about about what's about to happen did, did, next. Did you hear? I heard tittering in the background. I'm sure John Be- Barely was tittering in no, the background. He, he likes your singing too. I'm sure. I do. I do. <laughs> it's uplifting. Yeah, it is. It's nice. It's nice. That's well, not exactly what I've been told in the past. No, no, no. Open the show was the song it's good we like it <laughs> good morning everybody good it's a morning. beautiful day in los angeles today and it's uh, so much uh, great stuff happening uh, by the way i want to uh, give a shout out we have a, a, one of our first sponsors of peace fun radio apart from the fantastic speechly family uh who uh, supported the peace fund for the first couple of years yeah. uh, from victoria speechly's death after victoria who uh, worked with the fund for a, a long time she was a fabulous lady and uh, but this this show is actually uh, sponsored by K- uh, Kathy Carney. Uh, her message is to those who give the ultimate gift to our future generations: the gift of caring. Thanks, Adrian, for being their voice. You're welcome, Kathy. I think uh, I think uh, we're donating this to to uh, all those people that uh, that are the future ger- generations and caring for for them as we as we do this. Um, and have you guys – so let's just start off. I want to start this show because we've got a lot this morning to talk about. Uh, in the news, uh, the Zika virus outbreak. Uh, the World Health Organization held an emergency meeting on Monday to find ways to battle the Zika virus, which is linked to birth defects and spreading explosively throughout the Americas. Zika virus has spread to more than 20 countries in the Americas. Uh, it spread through mosquitoes like malaria or the West Nile virus. And it does not spread directly from person to person. Well, unfortunately, that's not necessarily true. It does. It's a sexually transmitted disease as well, from what I heard this I morning. I think there was. I think there was. Um, they're just now starting to do some ch- tests and make sure that that it's correct. But I believe there was um, uh, there was a sexual transmission of it in Tahiti, and I then uh, one in Dallas, Texas, according to uh, the Centers for Disease Control. And uh, also, it uh, looks like the someone who ret- returned from Venezuela affected the person in Texas. So, well, the interesting thing, John, is that it's—I've uh, never heard of it. I mean, have you ever heard of the Zika virus? Anybody here? I mean, I, I've not heard of the. Zika I virus. first heard of it on the Daily Show. Did I you know. hear it on the Daily Show? Yeah. I mean, it's—it's—it's it's, it's, it's interesting. Like the West Nile virus, all these suddenly turns out I, all these viruses that yeah. happen. But we, we we do have to talk about it because you know, although the effects are generally mild. The greatest concern about this one, it's strongly suspected it's linked with brain, brain defects in babies. Hmm. The infection has been linked to cases in microcephaly in which babies are born with underdeveloped brains. There have been about 4,000 reported cases of, of micro, I, I hope I'm saying it right, microcephaly in Brazil alone since October. The WHO alert p- puts Zika in the same category as of concern as, uh, as, the, as the Ebola virus. It means research and aid will be fast tracked to tackle the infection. There's the WHO uh, uh, Director General, uh, Margaret Chan, called Zika an extraordinary event that needed a coordinated response. She said the, the priorities were to protect pregnant women and their babies from harm and to control the mosquitoes that are spreading the virus. Huh. Really, I mean, that's um, never heard about this before, but obviously it, it, it apparently makes the brain smaller in the baby, which is, you know. Is a, is a is a birth defect. Um, so um, any women that are considered traveling to uh, the areas affected by Zika, check it check it out online. You should seek advice from your physician if you're going to be living in the areas affected by Zika and protect yourselves against mosquito bites by wearing repellent. Let's lather it on. It's like uh, sunscreen. We tend to put sunscreen on once and then forget about it for the rest of the day. Well, after the, that, it wears off. You've got to keep reapplying. Did you Did you know that a guy made millions of dollars by going to each of the sun cream uh, companies and said, I can make you sell more product? And they're like, well, how do you do that? He put three 
three letters at the at the bottom, which basically said must reapply every two hours. That's, that's what he got. That, and so he went to all of them because basically that's what happens. You put it on, you go yeah, in the water, it right. come, comes off, so your protection becomes less. So what they did was keep, people keep using it, they're buying more product. He, got, he made millions on it just by, by putting that, going to the labels and doing that. I also wanted to throw out a quick link like to it. anybody who would like to learn more about the Zika virus, how it's transmitted, how to prevent it. You can go to the Centers for Disease Control uh, and Prevention website at cdc.gov. And they have all kinds of information there that is being updated as new information come becomes available. And as, as Adrian and Ethan said, you know, this isn't something that's that's getting a lot of it's getting some news attention, but it's not something that uh, that a lot of people are aware of. So be aware, and that information is out there. So um, while you all think about that one, we're going to continue. This week we have the culmination of our focus on education and technology. Not necessarily the culmination of it, but the culmination of our contest that uh, we have run. A uh, Surface Tablet Initiative uh, will bring 90 ta new tablets into needy classrooms, needy classrooms, and it'll be wrapping up this week. Uh, but the learning is going to just begin for the students who are going to be in the nine winning classrooms. For those of you that did not know, we have our, our contest is on Facebook, on the Peace Funds Facebook page. Uh, I've been tweeting about it for the past three days. We've had f a close to 4,000 votes now have been cast in this, which I think is a great testament to that. Um, and we will be announcing the winners uh, uh, later uh, today or tomorrow the, this is the last day for voting so those of you that haven't voted please go there and view our projects uh, at the peace fund at the peace fund and some of these some of these actual projects I don't know if any of you have you ever seen some of them John I don't know I do they're fantastic yeah they're it's absolutely amazing fantastic. what these kids have been able to do especially elementary school kids I mean, they've yep, really they're, gotten involved. There are categories for elementary, middle school, and high school. And as Adrian said, facebook.com slash the peace fund. The post is right at the top of the page, and there are links to vote for each of those three categories. And you can go and you can read about the projects. You can see videos that the kids have made about the projects and see the, the heart and the thought and the ingenuity that these young kids have poured into some of these projects. It's really inspiring and exciting. Yeah, I think uh, it's all testament to... Uh to um, all the hard work. I mean, we've had uh, some great people working on it as well. So I think it's, um, it's uh, you know, the, the LAUSD have done a great job uh, spreading all the, the information out there. The kids out there have really worked hard at putting this stuff together. And, um, you know, kids need technology, especially at a younger age, as, well, as long as it, it improves their education and adds to their physical education, I would say, so that whether it is sports or whether it is something as simple as reading or writing, I think all of it should go together as a compact uh, package rather than just saying let's just deal with technology because I can later on be an IT expert and do the video games. That's not necessarily healthy. Mm. Um, we will be, I will be there on Saturday to hand these out to the nine winning classrooms. Now, how does the winning work? The, 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 the classrooms, this is how the, the voting will go. Uh, we will have – there's a category for each. Elementary, as you said, John, mid um, – uh, Middle school middle and school high school. And mm -hmm. high school, which totals three classrooms, uh, and that would be 30 tablets. The top classroom from each of those categories will receive 10 Microsoft Surface uh, uh, tablets. So keep voting because the top three will receive that from each of the different uh, top one out of each different category will receive a, a 10 tablets from there the remaining six winners six classrooms will be chosen by the numbers based on the public voting so basically if it could be the next six come from elementary school who knows or they right. come from high school but you've got to go out there and vote you've got to be out there to vote so that you can actually help these kids and see which ones really you think deserve these these tablets so it will be done like that i will also have a little surprise for another classroom but we'll get to that later on um we also have a, a really nice article about this from our friends at the LAUSD you can go to LAUSD daily Dot net and read uh, read an article about uh, about Adrian and what the Peace Fund is doing. You can also find a link to that on the Peace Fund Facebook. Thank you, John. Um, Good. Yeah, <clears throat> there's one other thing. I, just so that you guys out there know, we have important facts we need to sort of share with you about technology in education. 
as much as 60% of the schools in America use laptops or tablets for their students. 41 of the students are in favor of taking virtual classes, and 50% of students in middle and high school use the internet to complete work three times a week. Now, the students... Students... Yeah, oh, go ahead, go ahead John. Go ahead. You... Oh, I was going to say, students that do study on computers, phones, and tablets study for an average of 40 minutes more per week than those who did not. And more than 60% of parents support the fact that technology has increased students' engagement, provided personalized learning, and improved home-to-school communication, according to a study by Education Tech Review. And they also actually mentioned, and this is what we're talking about now, is that the Im- effective impl- implementation of technology, in other words, putting it correctly in the classrooms and probably balancing out well with other, other factors, is very important for parents, uh, for parents in their child's success. 87% of parents say that this that this is a very important factor and 50% label it as extremely important again that's from the education tech review uh, 84% of teachers surveyed say that today's digital technologies are leading to greater disparities between affluent and disadvantaged schools and school districts and that is why we need to be able to put these uh, this technology in the hands of those who cannot afford it a lot of schools, as we've talked about in the past, have budgets that have been cut and cannot afford technology in their schools. They can barely afford books in some cases. So um, we want to do something that uh, will be able to uh, alleviate that fact. Now, my goal is not to make this a one-off, is to continue to go to great companies like Microsoft and maybe some of their competitors uh, to actually continue this every year to bring this type of program to a school, but make sure that the kids understand that they have to engage to make a wage. (laughs) In other words, you can't get something for nothing. Right. Right? You cannot just say, well, we're going to get computers anyway. Don't worry about it. No. I don't agree with that. I think you have to be able to show that you're willing to work for it. And that's what our Helping Hand programs have been all about, about sharing with the, the recipient the responsibility of raising that money or the, or, the, or the content that they need with the family or with the recipient to show that they really want that, that, uh, that piece of technology or that piece of help that we would be able to give them. I think that's very important to actually mention. I agree. Um, teachers, Technology problems <laughs> <laughs> but we have we have solutions yeah we have solutions there are always solutions only one third of teachers report that they feel prepared to use computers for a classroom and that is why when we go in there we will be having a microsoft tech chad hawthorne coming down specifically to be able to um uh, show the teachers how these things are used i mean th- we've talked about this before i mean ethan you and i come from an era you know where computers began not when you know not what like now it's like twitter and facebook this is like it's stuck to my finger yeah the only computer we were really familiar with was the one in war games that was going to destroy the world (laughs) well you know that's the same thing with teachers it was the size of like a a costco (laughs) inside (laughs) well i remember my first mac computer it was a size of like five bricks and the screen was about, mm, about mm, I'd say about six inches across. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a tiny little thing. And we've come a very long way from there. But my point is, teachers in classrooms, they can't, a lot of them are in their 40s and 50s yeah. and 60s. They come from the same era. It's only been the past 15 years that we really have seen the explosion of social media and, and the digital technology that we are so accustomed to today. Right. Well, the kids, the kids come into the classrooms with way more computer experience lots of times in the teachers just because kids are learning it and have access to it at a far younger age than they ever did before well this actually goes to my point about teachers that's 77 77 percent of them report spending 32 or fewer hours on technology related professional development activities so on the flip side children that are exposed to media and technology are are being exposed to it earlier than ever and a Common Sense Media report found that 38% of kids under age 2 have used tablets or smartphones. And we brought that last week. We were all kind of, as we used to say in England, gobsmacked. <laughs> yeah. I'm gobsmacked uh, to, uh, to actually really understand that, uh, that, that number. Um, There's actually a term now, digital immigrants, it's, you know, where you've, you know, the older teachers are finding technology to be somewhat of a foreign concept. So the young, younger kids are the digital natives and the teachers are the digital, digital immigrants who are sort of coming to it. You know, um, 
Uh, I'm glad as you mentioned that, John. I mean, I, I want to just uh, touch on the older teachers again. You know, uh, older teachers, like immigrants, would find going to something new uh, a foreign concept, which applies to both. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got the younger digital natives, which are our kids, and on the other hand, the digital immigrants, <laughs> which are our teachers, in a sense, because right. we're just becoming, you know, we're, we're learning this new stuff. Um, common analogies comparing the two groups would be the way they edit papers. A digital immigrant would print a digital document and mark it up with a pen, whereas a digital native would use online reviewing tools like track changes to make edits. It's a simple thing. I mean, today, I don't know, signing documents. I mean, I remember signing documents for my house. Now you do it on a right signature. You just go in there. I'm signing contracts. I don't have to get the papers, print them out, yeah, write them out all the time. Crazy. You can just do it online now. You just digitally yeah. sign it. I mean, so it's a whole different way we're looking at these. So how do these concepts relate to classrooms? Teachers who find themselves speaking a different technology language than their students need support to take advantage of the power that technology can have on students' growth and success. Process involves a few key steps. What do you reckon Positive. that is? Positive attitude. Thank you, John. Thank yes. you, John. Be open to technology and the potential it holds. What else? Professional development. And what would you class that as, John? The learning curve where individual teachers, it's going to vary significantly for teacher to teacher, and you're going to have to have step-by-step -step assistance and others finding sessions and that are going to find an unproductive use of time. Um, using peer networks within schools can learn can help teachers learn how to properly use devices to find in inspiration for using them in class and can provide a stopgap option in a collaborative working environment. Basically, the buddy system. You're not in this alone. Technology can be a little bit overwhelming at first, but work together, figure it out. And, and I think the other thing is, I mean, we spoke on the show a long, uh, quite a long time ago, about a year ago, actually, I mean, we've done so many shows now, but um, on the fact of allowing the kids to have a voice. That's why we have Kid Heroes of the Week, to have a voice. And this works very um, um, succinctly with the fact of allowing students, the digital natives, if you want, to lead that technology in the classroom, which can be empowering and exciting for both the, the, the students and the teachers because the students know what technology they, they'll prefer to use and what tools works best for them and how to get the most out of the resources given to them. And by allowing, I think by allowing the kids to provide input in, in, in constructive, constructing activities, you'll create a higher level of engagement and commitment to learning. It's like anything. You actually allow the kids to have their own opinion on what it is and they're going to be much more engaged in actually being able to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's also, too, the idea of the no fear of failure policy. You know, teachers need that freedom to innovate, to use failure as fuel for reflection and growth rather than seeing it as a setback. You can reward teachers who embrace technology through simple shout-outs at a faculty meeting, a note of, appreci of appreciation that can build that foundation for a school culture where the students and the teachers are creative and innovative and they're working to uh, resolve these things together. You know, it's funny. I, I was actually at my, at my daughter's school a little while ago and, and – uh, uh, she came out of her um, singing class, and uh, one of the other uh, uh, mothers was. I was talking to one of the other mothers, and she said, um, "Wow, it's it's amazing how they do it, and I can't believe it." And I said, "It's a real simple thing. Kids don't have any fear. Right. There is no fear. Kids don't have that. Oh my God, I can't do it. Oh my God, I've right. already put my finger in the plug, and I'm going to get electrocuted. Oh my God, they don't have that. And us, as we get older, we tend to have barriers as, as to what we can or cannot do." And I think that's what you're talking about, John, is allowing the teachers to go back to their kids and say, oh, it's okay. I, even though I don't know it, it's okay. Let's, let's, let's move forward because that no fear policy is, is, uh, uh, is, is key in us adults because we always have we, the thought that it's going to be too hard or too long or too, you know, I, I don't have the resources or I don't have the, the knowledge or whatever that is. I think and I think it's, it works well in both ways too because for the teacher's point of view, you know, you're, you're building a deeper bond with the students. From the students' point of view, it makes them feel like, hey, I, I, I showed my teacher something today, and that makes them feel good about themselves. It's just, I think it's just positive all the way around. Yeah, I, I like it with my son, John. I mean, he goes, I told you so. I told you I'm doing that. I told, I'm like, oh, God, he sounds like me. Um, <laughs> but that's the fact. The fact is that... Ethan was very silent there. He's yeah, I know. Yeah. Ethan, Ethan agrees. He knows, agree. his, he, he, he knows his daughter's doing exactly the same thing. Yep. 
<laughs> See, he's like, yeah, done that, been there, done that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it, but it, it is important. Technology, I mean, it really is a focal point on, in the national education debate right now. Uh, computer literacy is still often confused with computer uh, computer science, and I think that's that's uh, an issue we have to look at. Computer literacy refers to word processing and the use of the internet. Computer science refers to the study of algorithmic processes, hardware and software designs, and uh, and ways that impact society with technological innovation. So there are two, they're two totally different things. A general computer science curriculum largely consists of critical thinking, problem solving, and, and logic the skills that American students will need in order to comp- compete for the best jobs, whether or not they become programmers. So and it's interesting how it changes over time. You know, a hundred years ago, being literate meant that you were able to read and write. And now with mobile phones and the internet, you know, it's changing how we get information. It changes how we interact. Technology has just become this fundamental part of our everyday lives. And that's why computer program programming, I think is that, that new type of that new literacy that students need. Yeah, I mean, I remember 100 years ago. <coughs> <laughs> hey, I remember the days then. Um, sorry about that. I just had a flashback. Um, <laughs> a flashback to a flashback. A flashback to a flashback. <laughs> uh, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, tough. Um, <laughs> information technology was one of the science, technology, engineering, and math at STEM fields, which we've talked about before. Uh, with the most job postings in the U.S. in 2013, and job postings requiring coding skills stayed open the longer the most. And we've talked about this before, that in the future, within the next next 10 years, America's job system is going to be still crying out for applicants, and we won't have students or, or uh, applicants are able to actually fulfill those jobs because they might not have had the tools to learn to, to, to apply for those positions. So information technology, getting technology into the classrooms is an important factor these days. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, our hero of the week, Harry McCann, who called in from Ireland, who was talking about Let's Teach com, which is his initiative to basically – teach coding as, as a language, and he's partnering with schools across the globe to, to get those initiatives going, to teach kids that language, to get them familiar with it and comfortable with it in, at an early age so that they're able to uh, better perform when they, when, they, when they get to that STEM portion of their, of their education as they move forward. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm actually in the process right now of possibly looking at interns for something, and uh, the intern programs around the U.S. are – Amazing in in uh, higher education in colleges etc. They offer credit for students who uh, um, will work on the subject matter that they need credits for in their education. I think that's a great way of looking at. It. Obviously, some people call it slave labor, but um, I th- from my point of view, I think you should also pay some money to these uh, college graduates if they have the uh, the skills that you you need for them to help you and help them further their education, even though it's something that will be a, of minor value uh, uh, in, the, in the grand scheme of things uh, in, in comparison to regular wages. However, you've got too few of America's K-12 public schools actually teach computer science bases and fewer still offer it as a credit. So I think, you know, maybe we should also be talking about that. Maybe. You know, so it's, uh, you know why, is it dis- why is there a disparagement between... Um, college and k-12 and those schools in between so uh, the, all those classrooms in between and why isn't there enough computer science in schools why is it but lots of reasons yeah many reasons why american schools report teaching coding so many that the computer science teachers association or the csta published a 75 page report enumerating what those reasons were. The biggest is that public school system is decentralized. You have most public schools following national teaching guidelines, common core, and complete standardized tests that are based on those. But U.S. states and local bodies make classroom-level decisions. That's why computer science has a hard time finding a place because it can fall under pretty much any letter of the STEM acronym. You, Some states you know, classify it's, it's, it as own subject. It's just, yeah. It's interesting because I think, you know, it's very similar as we move forward with technology with our world that is growing so fast. You know, the, the world has gotten a lot smaller than when I was a kid and, I, and most of us remember it being. Um, it's become a lot smaller. We've dealt with many issues on Peace Farm Radio, and one of the things uh, we've, we've talked about are kids' uh, ailments and, and how um, 
uh, birth defects, uh, 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 um, uh, brain um, autism, for instance, uh, has uh, was originally lumped into um, uh, physical, uh, was it mental disabilities? But it's actually its own type of of category. It's not lumped in, and in the same way. Uh, computer science is lumped into uh, uh, it's, it's not its own subject it's, it's, it's you know uh, that some lump it into the math and science thing but it really is its own thing and, and I think the funny thing is I, I saw that a Kentucky lawmaker at one point even tried to have programming lang- languages treated as foreign languages mm. <laughs> so you're talking another language yeah you are but it's a little bit different right um, I don't know what he was thinking but you know it'd be kind of interesting um, but even if a school district correctly identifies computer science or programming classes, you've got there are there are more obstacles to it. Um, schools might not have room in the schedule or funding for another course, uh, since computer science classes are often uh, electives. That means they're optional. Students they might choose easier subjects instead, or the most basic problem: a school in a poor district may not have enough computers or internet access to teach a course. And that's something we talked about last week, John, wasn't it? When we talked about, and Ethan, when we were talking about some of the courses that are now in the textbooks, in the tests that our children take, come from the internet. Right. And I was going to throw in really quickly that uh, uh, the Senate president pro tem from uh, Frankfort, Kentucky, was uh, David Givens, who had filed a bill in the 2015 Kentucky General Assembly. Um, his quote was, the computer programming is truly a language, and let's be honest, it's foreign to a lot of people. Now, the critics feared that the bill would sacrifice uh, other important studies that would help students compete in an international economy, other languages. Uh, and that's something that's still uh, an issue that's still still ongoing at the moment. You know what, John? This is why we have you on the show. I didn't know that. I say something, John finds me the information. That's what I love. Just like a mafia boss. Just- <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to kind of uh, make a slightly different comparison here, Ethan. Just I'm so just you know, stating I'm just- the obvious. Okay. <laughs> um, um, I don't think I'm tough enough to be a mob boss. I don't think I can. <laughs> I, I, don't think I crack under the pressure, I think. Let's be honest. You know, there's there's also the fact that we have a disparagement in the actual um, physical makeup that you know, um, African American and women uh, see many of their older counterparts succeeding in uh, certain professions, and so, but they're they they don't see that people are succeeding in in those professions, and they're more likely not to su- not to pursue it. For example, girls consistently receive the message, both implicit and explicit, that science and math aren't for them i know my wife is not a great math person but i think a lot of the time you're told this and i think power of the brain is very important if you believe you can do something you will do it same as kids when they are interested in something that they are going to be much more attentive to being able to do that that actual uh, activity same thing with um uh women who, 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 who would be more of them graduating college with math and science degrees if their middle and high schools employed more women to teach those exactly. subjects? Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, and when younger kids learn computer science, you know they learn that it's not just this confusing string of letters and numbers, but it's a tool. You can build apps, you can create artwork, you can test a hypothesis. It's not hard for them to transform their thought processes as it is for older students. And if you can break down problems into those bite-sized chunks and use code to solve those, it becomes it becomes normal to them. You have more children in this training and you can increase the number of people who are interested in those fields and kind of help fill that jobs gap, including the teachers, as Adrian just said, uh, who would um, you know, it would be great to have more more women teaching those subjects in high schools. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, the, the the access to technology is something that I think we are we are discussing now. And I, you know, give more children training could increase the number of people interested in a field and help them fill the jobs gap that we we discussed earlier on in the show. Um, you know, there's a it's interesting. I, I, informational divide is 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 a note I have here in front of me. Uh, the guesstimate is that only five to ten percent of schools teach computer science based largely on the data on students who take the AP test. Not the Adrian Paul test, gentlemen. <laughs> Not the AP. It's the AP test. Uh, what, what's, what does AP stand for, John? Associated Press. Oh! No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> oh, I was testing you there, John. <laughs> testing you. Actually, you find that out. The AP test in computer science, <laughs> the real percentage may be lower. Nobody tracks the figures nationally. 
Uh, so there's actually some figures here that we have from uh, the last year's uh, data. In Mississippi, Montana, and Wyoming, no girls took the computer science exam. Zero. In 11, in 11 states, no African-American students took it. In eight states, no Hispanics took it. In 17 states, fewer than 100 stu students took it. Now think about that. We're dealing with something, computer science, something that is going to shape our world and is shaping our world today, and our students are not going out there to take those tests. Yeah, That's disturbing. Very. So think about that, parents, when you're, when you're listening to this. Um, and by the way, Adrian, uh, AP stands for Advanced Placement. I had to Google it. I knew so that. Obviously, I knew that. So obviously I am neither advanced nor placed this morning. <laughs> you're definitely placed, John. You're placed in that closet that we like to place you in every single week. <laughs> <laughs> um, <sighs> actually I do want to uh, uh, mention there's a couple of other things that we talked about here um, increasing access to technology uh, there are districts where technology spending has been cut and we've talked about that before and expansion has been slow really taken down to really like a crawl because teachers are searching for ways to connect their class to their classrooms and as a result, many teachers have to create their own technology supply or provide administrators with alternatives for placing devices into students' hands. And that's something I think we could possibly be creative with. I mean, I think this is what the Peace Fund, uh, this initiative, uh, taking it into the LAUSD schools, has been all about, is being creative with the way that you actually place technology into children's hands. I mean, all the ways, when you look at the, the ways these kids actually um, uh, presented the reason why they would do it, what they would do with it, how they would do it, it's really interesting. Really interesting. The varying coming from interviews being done to the other students from doing uh, presentations on it from video clips that were funny from the, the the creative minds of children is astounding to me and, they, and these kids put a lot of work into it so i think we should be just as creative to to try and have technology and and and, and provide administrators with those alternatives for placing those devices in our kids hands well, there's the uh, you know the phrase BYOD, bring your own device, which is starting to pop up in some of these instances, and it provides an opportunity for students to use their own devices in class, and it's a good option for students who are already familiar with those devices, and the districts don't have to foot the bill. I guess my concern with that is, you know, what about the kids who can't afford those devices? I mean, you know, these these things are very expensive. I remember when I was, uh, you know, a junior in high school when we had to buy a graphing calculator for. For, uh, for calculus and you're talking uh, you know at the time it was an 85 100 dollar calculator and that was a massive that was a massive purchase for 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 my family and and, and for a lot of others there, there when is you're talking also, about tablets that's that's hundreds of dollars there is also the leasing program which i i, I just found about that it's they it requires a certain level of infrastructure but it provides students with an opportunity to lease a device from the school at a lower cost which I think is, you know, it's a good idea, like a micro loan. Yeah, it's a micro loan. So in other words, you know, in other words, you're leasing it for that education. So yeah. instead of costing you two hundred dollars, it might cost you ten for the, the. Maybe that's what we should invest in around here. It's it's not a bad not a bad idea of actually looking at it because. And there's actually a strategy to create a student peer and contracts since those you know the additional cost of purchasing purchasing those devices is so high. There's a potential for those things to be abused or, or broken. Uh, leasing payments can help schools maintain technology by covering repair and replacement costs, while students and parents assume responsibility for the individual devices, which is kind of one way to tackle tackle that issue. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think the um, I think it's an easier way to actually put the burden because we talk about uh, the fact of lower income parents not being able to afford these things, right. and, and like a lot of people. I mean, you know, to be honest, a five hundred dollar um, you know uh, investment into a into a computer, for instance, uh, or a three three hundred to five hundred dollar investment is a lot of money. It's a lot of money for for some for some people. That's you know that could yeah. be the rent for the month. Jeez. So you know it's 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 not as easy to do. But there is the I actually like the fact, and maybe some of you want to consider doing this. Is putting ten dollars away a month, and think about that. In, in five months, that's fifty bucks, or fifty bu fifty bucks, or thirty bucks, or some small amount. In a year or so, you'd be able to actually put the money together to actually do that. Or 
go out there yourselves find the money in innovative ways kids are so creative we've had kids on our show before who have been creative in raising hundred and fifty thousand dollars or two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for other people raising three or four hundred dollars can be something as simple as having friends or, or sponsor you on a walk you're doing or going out there to do your mom does a yoga class or your mom does a a, a, a walkathon or your mom does something of that nature that will allow you to do that if you're raising money for your kid people will definitely um uh, look at it in a totally different way because you're putting your back behind it to raise that money mm -hmm. you know there's, there's there are smaller ways to actually do that you know it's it's you know um and i think that but it's the want and the ability to do it i think sometimes is lacking well, the world, there's a will, there's a way. And as our heroes of the week you mentioned earlier prove every week, if these kids want to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for a cause, they don't take no for an answer. They do it. Right. But, I mean, you know, we also talk about, I mean, sometimes the, 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 the fact is that, you know, some kids now are very uh, expectant. They expect things to be there, especially since we have technology. They would expect to have technology in classrooms, and a lot of c uh, schools do have that technology in the classrooms. But to ensure teachers are actually using the computer labs uh, that are already exist, you know, we don't want to have technology underused. So those who hold the keys to the budget will be more resistant to increasing it if they see that it's not actually being used. And that goes down to the teachers being able to actually utilize the computers in the room and use the the, the, the classroom as a learning curve on those computers. So if that that is going to give them a better education, better test scores, and that school is going to get a better result from it, they're going to invest more money into those computers. Right. And then they also, you know, Studies talk about how since computer labs usually have limited time, you've got lots of students, you know, your entire school using one lab of computers. Students and teachers can plan to make the most of it. You can write down your questions in advance, uh, scope out potential websites for students before you go into the lab so that you can actually maximize the amount of time and what you can do while you're there. Right, right. Let's have a few shout outs to organizations making a difference in this particular field uh, right now. Um, yeswecode.org. That's Y E S, wecode.org. They're recruiting hundreds of grassroots training programs and teaming up with major technology partners, celebrities, and political leaders to promote the goal of training 100,000 low opportunity youth to become high level computer programmers. So you can check them out at www.yeswecode.org. They yeah. Go ahead, John. Sorry. No, they're really cool. They they um their initiative targets uh, low pro low opportunity youth and provides them with necessary resources and tools to become world class computer programmers. Um, by learning this highly valuable and relevant 21st century skill, according to Yes We Code, these people, young people are shifting the trajectory of their futures and transforming their relationships with their communities and their countries. It's uh, great and, work they're and doing. I and I think the important thing is, is they're, they're looking at the low opportunity youth as well because we're talking about the disparagement between high and, and, and low opportunity youth, uh, and that is getting bigger because of the fact that uh, the low opportunity uh, uh, students cannot afford that technology in the classroom. So I think, you know, diversity mm -hmm. brings so much more to the table. And actually, uh, Stephen Wozniak, a co Apple of founder, actually said this. And he said, by focusing outside of the usual and rewarding all sorts of the people in tech, we can only make it better. And he said, yes, we code is doing that. And Steve Wozniak, the co founder of Apple. So I think that was a good. Um, shout out he gave them one other organization script ed uh, script ed uh, is um, a, uh, an organization uh, at script ed dot org equips students in under resourced schools with the fundamental coding skills and professional experiences that together create access to careers in technology it was founded with the idea that we could change students lives by teaching them code and they were featured on a cbs news segment in 2013 
They go directly to schools, too, with their tuition-free program. They create curriculum in collaboration with volunteers, which ensures students have exposure to the most up-to-date knowledge available. The courses are taught by experienced software developers on a volunteer basis, and uh, the students are then able to apply their new coding skills and paid summer internships where they gain the experience and confidence necessary to pursue careers in technology. For those, of you, .org. for those of you right now that are going, wait a minute, why do they keep talking? Don't they have a Hero of the Week? Not this week, but we will have others. Yes. We will have more very soon. And the reason why is because this weekend, Mr. Detmeyer and myself will be taking Peace Farm Radio to the LAUSD schools. On the road. On the road. And we will be interviewing some of these teachers. And they, for me, teachers are the heroes uh, in this particular instance. Uh, because they're the ones that are guiding our children to a better future and this economy and our country and our lives to something that is a little bit more re rewarding. So we will be having uh, a lot of information next week and clips from the show, possibly next week or the week after, as to what they think uh, is uh, some of the challenges that they face in the classroom uh, for elementary, mid, and high schools to, to, to achieve the goals that uh, obviously is has now been uh, been changed because of the advent of technology and and computers in the classroom itself. Um, we're going to go down there, right, Ethan, and uh, bang out a few things this weekend. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Actually, it'll be fun. Yeah, and actually, Bev Shahar is going to be with us. We're oh, fine. Yay! We like Bev. Bev's fantastic. She's Bev is the best. She's flying in uh, from. Uh, 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 I, want to, I, want to, I almost said Denver then, um, Atlanta. <laughs> from Atlanta. Uh, and uh, so she'll be with us this week. And also we've, we've got a lot of really exciting stuff about to happen. I'll be announcing that in the next co coming week, uh, couple of weeks. Um, there's some other things that I'm going to be doing that will actually uh, be partnering Port Peace on Radio perhaps with some other uh, uh, places. And uh, so this year is going to be a really big boom for the Peace Fund and uh, Peace Fund Radio as well. Uh, I also want to give a shout out uh, to uh, Kimberly Moore and um, Renee Nezoda, who this morning uh, I had a chat this morning regarding those 5,000 books going down to El Salvador. We'll be bringing you more information about the Luchi lights that we were able to fund, as well as the computers that were donated to us. John, um, I know you were the one that uh, initiated that and some of the books as well. It's really exciting how some of our heroes of the week stepped up to the plate, and we actually have some more heroes who are um, hopefully getting ready to come on board the project project as well with some new books. We'll hopefully have some more information information on that next week. Uh, Christopher Cow and his team from RebootForYouth.org uh, put together 13 laptop computers. They take donated computers. Uh, they totally refurbish the machines to get them into you know, maximum performance shape. They put all kinds of educational software on those for the kids. And it was a Herculean effort for these kids. I mean, these, are, these, are, these are teenagers in high school who are they, they put together a group of it was like 80 computers for uh, a school in Liberia, uh, 13 for Kimberly, and they put together a bunch of others. So they were able to work in this, this order of computers for Kimberly in the middle of their classes and this massive order of 80 computers that they had already uh, committed to the school in Liberia. It was a huge effort. And also Harper and Maggie, ages uh, 10 and 12, who uh, were on our show a few weeks ago as well. Their organization is booksandablanket.com. And they sent uh, toys and books to the kids as well. And we'll have more information on all of that uh, on next week's show. Um, I also wanted to throw in a couple of quick uh, updates about uh, some of our heroes of the week. Dalton Sear, young singer, songwriter, musician who's been a Peace Run Radio Hero of the Week, longtime friend of the show. He's been in the studio several times to play music, to talk about his anti-bullying initiatives. A uh, national ambassador for our wish-fulfilling friends over at the Dream Factory. Uh, performs at children's hospitals, always brings good music and good messages to kids. He has a new song called Invisible, and he's putting together a contest called Nobody Should Be Invisible on Valentine's Day. Go to Dalton's Facebook page at facebook.com slash Dalton Sear official fan page. That's Dalton C-Y-R official fan page to find out how to receive a special Valentine's Day from Dalton message from Dalton as he continues his good work of promoting self-worth worth and self-esteem in children and teens. Um, he's an excellent young man who's doing a lot for kids. Um, always works that into his, uh, his music and his message. Uh, also, Nicholas Lowinger, I wanted to quickly announce he was the founder of Gotta Have Soul at gottahavesoul.org. That's S-O-L-E. 
to provide shoes and other assistance to homeless and at-risk children and veterans and homeless shelters in 43 states. He's, he's expanded his efforts that far. In 2015 alone, Nicholas distributed shoes to 45,000 homeless and vulnerable children, 45,000 in one year. And now he's working hard to invest in the educations of children. And just this morning, Nicholas announced that he'll be awarding five $1,000 scholarships to young students who display strength of heart, dedication to community, dreams for the future, financial need, and personal impact. Go to gottahavesoul.org for information. The deadline to apply is March 5th. And I love that. If it's right in with our education message that we've had uh, in education series we've had on the show even our heroes of the week now are handing out scholarships which is just exciting and wonderful to me that they're taking the opportunities that they had and helping other kids have the same it's incredible you know kimberly when i spoke to kimberly more um month or two ago she talks about you know having the kids that she supplies with her adopt a letter campaign uh, are so thankful that they want to help other kids as well, and they become her ambassadors. They do. I think it's that's, fantastic. I think that's that's part of it. And, and again, you know, what, all the stuff that you've been just mentioning, John, you're talking about teenagers and young people doing this goes back to the no fear. Tell an adult of 35 years old or 40 years old to put together all those computers and give them away for free while they're doing their main jobs. See how I many people will be able to do that. I remember talking to uh, Nicholas Lewinger's mother. Uh, he had this huge drive where he handed out shoes and gift, talk, gift cards to homeless children, homeless veterans. And there were people in, in the community who were adults who were, oh, well, he should have done it this way. Well, he should have done it this way. Well, while they were griping about how the 16-year-old kid was you know, putting shoes on the feet of homeless children and veterans, the 16-year-old kid was putting shoes on the feet of homeless children and veterans. Exactly. And it's just, you know. <laughs> it's, That's half it's, the thing. We talk so much about doing stuff. And, exactly. And sometimes exactly. Sometimes just going out and then doing it. Admittedly, sometimes you really need to structure things correctly before because sometimes you only get one chance at putting something forward. But – we do spend a lot of times procrastinating in looking at stuff and saying, okay, well, well, maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do that. And sometimes young people should teach us, no, just do it. Just go out there and do it. Exactly. Um, well said. I want to, I want to just, uh, again, the, this show is going out today for Kathy Carney. Nice. Kathy Carney. We thank like you again Kathy. for sponsoring peace fund radio today. Those of you that can, um, uh, or would like to sponsor it for someone, for their birthday, for Valentine's Day, for instance. Adrian will sing happy birthday. He will. I'll, I'll sing happy birthday to you on the radio. There you go. You might not like it, but that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> but we will like it very much. Yeah, Ethan will be taking video of it. Um, but Yes, you can go to the peacefund.org and click on our Peace Fund Radio supporter wall. Donations of $250 or more. We'll read your special message on the, on the show. Or as Adrian said, he will sing. Dedicated well, to a friend or family member for a birthday or holiday. Dedicated in honor of a lost one, loved one. Or dedicated to yourself because, hey, you're helping us protect, educate, and aid children everywhere. And uh, also, um, what are you guys doing for Valentine's Day? I know I've been kind of taken to task for it i mean sometimes I you get to, you get to well the thing is you get to valentine's you go oh my god it's valentine's day and what are we going to do <laughs> so i'll probably order a pizza and watch uh, the new episode oh, of walking dead that premieres that night <laughs> is, does it does it oh good actually because i'll take my wife out the night before because going out on the saturday what a couple of romantics no no, no. <laughs> really impressed no, i'm with going you i'm going out make I'm sure say- your wives and better halves don't get in the way of walking dead don't <laughs> Make sure if I if I had a wife, that is better. He doesn't have one. I do. I do. But I'm going to be doing special things. I think that's a good place to end the show because now (laughs) we know what everyone here is about. (coughs) Okay, so Ethan, what are you doing? Oh, I've got plans, and it doesn't Ah! involve zombies. It doesn't involve. Ah! He's got plans. Yeah, he, what, what, I, I'm not going to ask what those plans are. I can't reveal it because my us. wife listens to the show. Oh, okay. <laughs> Loda, he's, he's, he's now been put to test. Now he's going to have to take you out there somewhere. I'm actually taking my wife out somewhere too. Good so, But not on the night of because the night of it becomes hard to get reservations and all that stuff. Do it the night before. So, A lot of excuses I'm hearing. A lot of excuses. I don't excuse. Uh, anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening today. We are out of time. Once more, John, thank you for bringing us all that fabulous information. My and honor as always. Bev Shahara as well. Uh, and as I said earlier on, and I'm going to say it again, thank you, Kathy Carney, for supporting us today on Peace Fund Radio. And in closing... Uh, A closing quote from the founder of Yes We Code. 
Aptitude tests show one out of five kids of any color have an inherent aptitude for the kind of problem solving that is required to be a computer programmer. So that means one out of five kids out here in low-income communities, Native American reservations, Appalachia, housing projects, barrios, ghettos, could be on the Mark Zuckerberg track. This is Adrian Paul and Ethan Detmeyer. We'll bring you more news next week. You're listening to Peace Fund Radio with Ethan Denmeyer and Adrian Paul right here on L.A. Talk Radio.